So what are we going to do this evening? Well, I thought it might be valuable this evening if I discussed ways that you who want smaller government can use to be a more effective salesman of liberty, to be more persuasive among your friends and associates and the people that you talk to about government, liberty, human freedom, personal responsibility. Not everybody is articulate. Not everybody is skilled. Not everyone has the time to become more skilled. But each and every one of us has the opportunity to be more persuasive than one is at the moment. We can all improve, in other words. And when we do, not only does that improvement help us to become more persuasive and get others around us to uh, be more interested and more supportive of efforts to reduce government and to quit supporting those people who are making government larger, but being more persuasive and articulate also means that your friends and associates are less likely to think of you as some radical oddball. If you can show that you know what you're talking about, these people will come to think of you eventually, we hope, as somebody who's unusually perceptive rather than somebody who just has a bunch of strange ideas. Being persuasive, as I see it, starts by being in a position to understand thoroughly what you believe in. You can't defend or advance what you're not sure of. Now, I well understand that you can't be expected to know everything there is to know about the drug war, the environment, the education system, foreign policy, or any other issue that might arise. But fortunately, there are certain principles that if you understand these principles, they will allow you to transcend the details, to go straight to the heart of the matter without having to know all the fine little elements of any particular issue, all the things that you don't have time to discover and learn. For example, no part of the libertarian platform that I was called upon to defend and promote as the libertarian presidential candidate twice, no part of that platform made me the slightest bit uncomfortable. I don't care that there is... Uh, that if you read that platform literally, you must oppose laws governing child pornography, that you must oppose laws that uh, stop people from taking terrible drugs and things of this sort. Because I understood the principles that underlie all of this, I was not in a position where I had to defend child pornography or drug taking or anything else. And I believe you can put yourself in that same position. There really are six basic principles that I've identified that ought to be recognized regarding any government program that is being proposed, that exists today, that's being discussed in any way whatsoever. And it doesn't matter what the program is. It doesn't matter how laudable the objectives of the program. And it doesn't matter what terrible things are going on in the world right now that this program is supposed to correct and solve. Each of these six principles is vitally important to understand. And if you do understand just these six principles, you're in a position then to be able to rebut anything that anybody brings up. Let's look at each of them in this first segment of the broadcast. Number one, government is force. Every government program is backed by the coercive power to compel people to alter their lives in some significant way under penalty of fines or imprisonment. For government to provide what you want, it has to take it by force from someone else. That force doesn't only apply to criminals or to bad people. The force for, must first be applied against the innocent the people who must be forced to pay for the program, the people who must be forced to open their homes and their bank accounts and their businesses to government inspection and government uh, checking up to make sure that everybody's doing the right thing. Force is always the element in every government program. Either people are being forced to do something they don't want to do or forced to pay for something they don't want to pay for or are being forced to stop doing what they do want to do. If there were no element of force, it would not be a government program. And it is so easy to talk about solving this, about prescription drug subsidies, about a patient's bill of rights, about whatever it may be, and ignore the fact that we are talking about passing a law that's going to force people to do things. The Medicare regulations, for instance, are over 100,000 pages long, and doctors and patients who don't adhere to those regulations could go to prison, in addition to perhaps having to pay fines. Force is behind every government program. Do you really want to force people to get your way in this particular issue? Principle number two, government is politics. Whenever you turn anything over to the government, it no longer is a financial, medical, scientific, military, or social matter. It is now a political issue to be decided by whoever has the most political influence, and that will never be you nor I. It's easy to talk about all the good things we're going to do for people, but really, what we're talking about is letting Bill Clinton or Trent Lott or Jesse Helms or George Bush or Teddy Kennedy make decisions regarding your children. And you know, you know without a doubt that politics will be first and foremost in making their decisions. They will decide on the basis of what is politically profitable for them, how they can reward their friends, how they can punish their enemies, how they can make sure that they get reelected, not how this program can be fashioned in a way that's going to make society better. 
Principle number three, you don't control the government. No government program is going to operate the way you think it should. The politicians and bureaucrats will transform your great, wonderful idea into something that suits them, into something quite different from what you have been envisioning when you've been promoting this program. So all the talk about all the wonderful things this program or law is supposed to do is just simply talk. It is just pretend, and it has no relevance whatsoever to how politicians and bureaucrats will use the force of government to get what they really want. I call it the dictator syndrome. When you imagine a law, a program, something that the government can do to solve some great social issue, what you're imagining is that you are the dictator of the country, that you can actually make this law that what you think it ought to be, and that you can actually enforce this law and carry it out and execute it in the way that you want. But you can't. You're not a dictator. You're not anything. This law will be written by the aides of, again, people like Teddy Kennedy or Trent Lott or Tom Daschle. They will be carried out by bureaucrats who will have their own agenda. And if the particular law leads to court cases, then it will be decided by judges who were politically appointed. You don't control the government, so don't act as though you do. Don't make up great big ideas based on the thought that you are going to be able to see that these things work. Principle number four, power always grows. No government program stands still. Whatever the original budget amount, uh, whatever the original areas that were going to be covered, whatever the original objectives, the program or law will grow and grow and grow. It will be applied to areas that were never discussed when the original law was, in, uh, when it was enacted. And it will serve as a pre precedent to apply the same kind of pseudo-solution to other issues. When Medicare was set up in 1965, the politicians said that its cost in 1992 would be $3 billion, which is equivalent to $12 billion when adjusted to 1992 dollars. The actual cost in 1992 was not $3 billion, or $12 billion, what do you think it was? It was $110 billion, because once the original bill was passed, it just mushroomed from there on. They kept tacking on this, that, and everything else. And one of the most important parts of it was that the original bill said that the government could not interfere and make any decisions whatsoever regarding how a doctor treated a patient or how a hospital treated a patient. And, of course, that is completely thrown out the window. Once that law is in place, it is now a mechanism by which everybody can hang ornaments on it like a Christmas tree and expand it to suit themselves. The Civil Rights Acts of the 1960s were supposedly to outlaw state-sponsored ra racial segregation in the South. But they've been used to justify quotas, hate crime laws, laws forcing landlords and employers to do business with gays, people with children, people with disabilities, drug addicts or others that it might not be commercially profitable for them to do, or people even who are morally repugnant to them. We'll continue with this when we come back from this break. This is Harry Brown. Thanks for staying with us. I mentioned that there were six principles that go, actually it's seven principles that go right to the heart of the matter regarding any government program. And I've covered the first four, which are government is force, government is politics, and you don't control the government. And finally, number four, power always grows. Number five is that power is sure to be misused eventually. When you give a good politician the power to do good, you give many, many, many future bad politicians the power to do bad. As Michael Cloud has pointed out, the problem is not the abuse of power. It is the power to abuse. Once that power exists, it is bound to be abused. And in fact, it will act as a magnet for the worst kinds of people to try to get into office and use that power for their own ends. So the problem doesn't arise when a bad politician starts doing bad things. It arises when politicians in general are first given the power to do those things, whether or not they actually use it at first. The bombing of Iraq and Serbia and Afghanistan and the Sudan by Bill Clinton and George Bush are pretty much non-controversial because everybody's favorite conservative, Ronald Reagan, set the precedent way back in the 1980s by bombing Libya and invading Grenada. And once he had done that and got all the cheers and applause of all the conservatives and many liberals, then, of course, Bill Clinton was free to do whatever he wanted. George Bush Sr. was free to invade Panama, uh, and so on. On and on it goes. Principle number six, government doesn't work. Because government is force, because it is political, because your intentions aren't going to matter, because power will always be misused, government simply will not deliver what you want. I don't know of any government program that has actually achieved what was promised for it. Wars never achieve the results that are supposedly going to follow in the wake of victory. The war on drugs has been an enormous failure. The war on poverty has just been the most expensive boondoggle in the history of this country, and still the politicians come back year after year telling us these sad stories about all the people who need this and need that and need something else. For years and years and years, the politicians have been telling us how they're going to fix the education system. And But every year they come back pointing uh, with alarm at the terrible condition of the schools. The mail isn't delivered on time. Traffic jams on, on city roads. Whatever it is the government sets out to do, it never achieves it. And this is perhaps 
the most telling of the seven principles, that government doesn't work. So whatever this great big idea you have is of what it is that government's going to do to solve some problem, just recognize that it isn't going to work. Nothing government does because it is force. And we don't have time to go into it this evening, but force leaves in its wake all kinds of consequences that guarantee that a program is not going to work. Because of all of these principles, we come to principle number seven, which is that government must be subject to absolute limits. Because politicians have every incentive to expand government, and with it their own personal power, there must be absolute limits on government. They will always have people beckoning at them, saying, please pass this subsidy, please pass this law to quash the people that I don't like, please pass laws to keep smut off of television, please, 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 please. And politicians can always point and say, the people wanted this, we did it in response to popular demand, whatever it may be, and that popular demand may consist of 1% or 2% of the entire population, but it's sufficient. The only answer is to have tight, ironclad limits on what the government can do. And the Constitution provides the most obvious limits that we can impose upon the federal government. Until that Constitution is enforced again, we have no hope of containing the federal government. The Constitution worked well for the first hundred years, but it's not perfect. It was not self-enforcing. It did not have the means of making politicians pay for their transgressions when they violated the Constitution, and that's perhaps its greatest lack. They could never be held personally responsible and, in fact, are almost the opposite, that they are specifically held immune from any damage they do. When they put somebody out of work in Akron, Ohio, no politician pays the price for that. When some family is destroyed by asset forfeiture in Atlanta, Georgia, no politician is made to answer for this. When somebody else loses his job in Denver because of regulations imposed upon him uh, on his employer by politicians, no politician is made to cough up the money to make good what was lost in Denver, Colorado. We must make the politicians accountable. And the, but the first step is to establish absolute limits, and that means getting back to the Constitution. And if you break that, those limits for any good purpose, you have opened the door to breaking those limits for every bad purpose that you can imagine. So if there's some government program you don't like, you may have been the one that made that possible by asking for the government to overstep the boundaries with some other program, whether it's the war on drugs, fighting abortion, or whatever you think it might be. We'll be right back. I've been talking about ways that you might become more persuasive in talking to people about freedom. And it all starts with an understanding of government and the seven principles that I mentioned. They were, again, number one, government is force. Number two, government is politics. Number three, you don't control the government. Number four, power always grows. Number five, power is sure to be misused eventually. Number six, government doesn't work. And number seven, because of all the first six, government must be subject to absolute limits. Incidentally, I'll put these up on the website on the Radio Links page. I'll put a link to a brief article that I'll uh, have up there listing these so that you can refer to them when you want. Understand that when you're talking to someone, you don't have to bring up all seven of these principles. Uh, All you need is to bring up one of them, and maybe one of them will work with one person and not with somebody else. So it helps to become as conversant as you can with maybe three or four of these principles, the ones that you're most comfortable with. But I do strongly recommend that you bear down on the obvious fact That is so easily ignored, no matter how obvious it is, that government simply does not work. Now, these seven principles also lead to seven questions. You can just transform each of the principles into a question to ask somebody who is proposing a new government program or defending an existing one. Number one, do you really want to make this a matter of fines and prison terms? I understand your desire to see children educated or to do this or to do that, but do you really want to send people to prison who don't do what you want them to do in this particular case? Number two, do you really want to transform this matter, whatever it may be, into a political issue to be decided by politicians, whoever can come up with the most political influence, people like Bill Clinton, Trent Lott, Teddy Kennedy, or George Bush? Do you think that you have the political clout to overcome all these people? Because it's all going to become politics once Congress gets its hands on it or the state legislature. Number three, do you really expect that if this program were to be passed the way you want it, that it would retain its original size and scope forever without spreading into other areas of your life that you didn't intend it to spread into and affect you adversely? Number four, do you really think the program is going to operate in the way you imagine, knowing that you have no way to control it? You're not going to be in Washington to look over these people's shoulder and, and stop them whenever they go off in the wrong direction. Number five, do you really want to hand to the government power that can be misused in the future by some politician that you may despise? Number six, do you really believe this program or law will achieve its goal, knowing that no existing government program has matched whatever promises were made for it? Why in the world would you think that this program or law is going to work any better than all the failed programs of the past? 
And number seven, are you willing to breach the Constitution to have your way, knowing that this is just simply going to open the door ever wider to whatever tomorrow's politicians and special interest groups want to breach the Constitution for? I wouldn't think so. I'll put those seven questions up on the website also. Now, how do you talk to people uh, in conversations? How do you approach them on these things? Well, there are some things that should not be done, and we should start with that. There are three things in particular that I've noticed that many libertarians and some conservatives who really want smaller government try to do to impress upon people the importance of one side of an issue. But it is my belief that these uh, particular weapons, these tools, these approaches have absolutely no effect whatsoever. Someone may agree that, well, yeah, you're right, but that doesn't mean that person will enthusiastically support what you're trying to do. In fact, he'll just nod his head and say, fine, but you have not converted anybody. You've just won an argument. The first of these three is that you need to realize that no one is interested in your rights, and are in fact in anybody's rights except his own. Nobody cares that you have a right to keep and bear arms. The person only cares about whether it would be valuable for him to have that right, and if you don't talk to him in terms of what it means to him, then you are making no impression upon him whatsoever. The second mistaken approach is to quote authoritatively famous people who agree with you, whether those words come from the founding fathers or some celebrity today or some politician or whatever. Nobody cares if they, the, you say George Washington said this or that. Uh, the person may say, that's fine, and nod his head and say, well, yeah, that's right. That may be what the founding fathers intended. But that isn't important to the person unless the words themselves are persuasive. If the words are persuasive, if they state the case very succinctly and go right to the heart of the matter in a way that the person can see how this affects his life, then the fact that it was George Washington who said it or Thomas Jefferson or whoever uh, can just add a little icing to the cake. But the fact that some authority seems to agree with you is not going to convince anybody to change his attitude about something. And the third approach, ironically, is the Constitution itself. Saying that the Constitution doesn't allow something has no effect on somebody until he has recognized the importance of having strict limits on government. I often point out the reasons that the Founding Fathers put limits on government, but I'm talking about the reasons. I'm not pointing to the Founding Fathers as authority, saying that because they said this was right, then it is right. What I'm merely doing is pointing out that they had good reason to put these particular limits in the Constitution. So, again, somebody may agree with what you say when you use one of these approaches, but that doesn't mean that they're going to become a convert. Now, any of these particular things, the rights, the quotes, the Constitution, the Founding Fathers, all of this, all of that might be useful later, but only after the individual has begun to agree with you that his life would be better off with smaller government. Then rights and authoritative quotes and the Founding Fathers and so forth uh, may uh, begin to make much more sense to him, but they are not ways to get somebody to show interest where he hasn't had any interest before. So that brings us to the really important area now. What does get somebody's interest? Self-interest. That's it. First, foremost, beginning, ending, the whole story must be bound up in the individual's life. The person you're talking to is the most important person in the world to him and his family come a very, very close second. So what are the things that do get to people? His life, his family, his job, his savings, his retirement, his desires, his freedom. These are the things that are important, and these are the things you should be talking about. Every issue should be phrased in terms of the individual's own self-interest, not the interests of society, not the interests of America, not the interests of other people, but how this affects his life. Let's take some examples. Social Security. If it continues as a government program, you may get nothing and lose every dollar you've put into it. We need to get it out of the hands of government so that you have something you can rely on. Free trade. You should be free to buy whatever you want from whoever wants to sell it to you. Immigration controls. If we have further immigration controls, you're going to have to carry an ID card. Your wages will be lowered because your employer is going to have to spend a great deal of resources satisfying the immigration officials with inspections and forms and who knows what else. Police will be asking for your papers. Your life could become miserable. The environment. If the environmentalists and the politicians supporting them get what they want, we're going to have higher electric bills, air conditioning rationing, more pollution, dirty rivers. All of these things stem from government interference in the environment. The government is the biggest landholder in the country, and that's where most of the pollution takes place. And you are being asked to pay up for this pollution that's happening on government property. So let's get the government out of the property-owning business so that your taxes can go down, so that they will quit imposing these regulations, which make your life more difficult. The drug war. The drug war causes metal detectors to be at your children's schools. Unsafe streets where drug dealers hang out. Uh, asset forfeiture where you 
even though you don't take drugs, even though you don't deal in drugs, could lose your property because some neighbor who doesn't like you gives an anonymous tip to the police and they seize your property and you have to sue the government to get it back. I don't want that to happen to you. Medicare. Your parents are being forced into a program where they and their doctors have less and less control over their lives, and they're paying far too much for health care. Today, the average senior citizen pays more than twice as much out of his own pocket for health care, even after allowing for inflation, than seniors did before Medicare was passed in 1965. Yes, health care is more technologically advanced today, but so are computers, and the cost of computers has gone down to roughly 1% of what it was just 15 years ago. Medical care would go down, and your parents could get much better care if we got the federal government out of health care. Foreign policy. Your children could be called to fight and die in a foreign war, even if they're college students, even if they're girls. And that foreign war won't solve anything. Next year, other children will be sent off to die somewhere else. Now, as far as the issues are concerned, you need to find out what are most important to the individual of all these things. Somebody may express an interest in an issue, like the environment. Oh, we have to do something to stop the rape of the environment. And the person may just be repeating what he saw on television or something that somebody said to him, or he thinks this is what you're supposed to say if you're a learned, informed, sophisticated individual. So sometimes it helps to ask a few questions to see just how much better, how much uh, the person really cares about this particular issue. Now, some of these issues that I just discussed, I phrased in terms of the negatives, the bad things that can happen if we don't get the government out of these areas. But always, we must proceed towards a positive picture, a vision of what America could be. In other words, we need to paint a picture of a better America, showing the individual how much better his life, his family could be. When we repeal the income tax, if you're an average family, it'll probably mean an increase in your take-home pay of $10,000 a year or more. What will you do with that money? Will you put your child in a private school? Will you take better vacations every year? Will you set up a better retirement for yourself? Will you support your church or your favorite cause or charity in a way you've never been able to do before? What will you do with that money when we repeal the income tax? When we get the government out of regulating business, there'll be more opportunities for good jobs than there are today. When we get the government out of the health care system, health care will not only be much less expensive, it'll be much more accessible and more user-friendly. Doctors will start making house calls again. A hospital stay for appendicitis or something of that sort might take a day's wages instead of a week's wages as it does now. With a 5% uh, deduction from your paycheck that your employer arranges for you, put into a bank savings account, you could be a millionaire when you retire instead of relying on political promises with Social Security. Before we took this last break, I mentioned that we need to paint a picture of a better America, and I gave some examples. Let, let me give you a couple more before we move on. When the drug war finally ends, we will have safe schools. We will have no more metal detectors or need for them, no more searches of lockers, no more drug dealers on the street. The prisons will be emptied of nonviolent people making room for the thugs who should be put away, but who today get out on plea bargains and early release in order to make room for pot smokers and low-level drug dealers. Our foreign policy will be one of friendship towards all and animosity towards no one and no interference in anybody's affairs. America will be at peace. Our taxes will be much lower. There will be no foreign policy interventions in other countries that would cause terrorists to come over here and attack us, hoping to change our policies because our government would not have any policies to be changed in the first place. Americans would be respected everywhere in the world again instead of being thought of as bullies. And you can take any issue and just simply... Uh, go through that issue and look for the ways that this would affect the individual's life. And when somebody brings an issue up, try to think on your feet as quickly as you can of how this might affect his life. And if you can't think of anything, just ask him, well, how is this going to affect your life? And his answer to that, as halting and as inarticulate as it may be, may give you the key of how you should approach this. But the final question is, is all this worth the trouble? Why should we continue fighting when everything seems to be against us? The press, the, the government, the schools, both the liberal and conservative writers who thrive on big government, all these people are pushing and pushing and pushing for more and more government, not less and less government as we want. The campaign laws are stacked against this, but we have something that is far more important, far stronger, far more powerful than all of this that is arrayed against us, and that is human nature. No one wants somebody else controlling his life. Everyone believes that he wants to make his own decisions, even if the decision he wants to make is to de delegate the decision-making to somebody else, he still wants to choose to whom he'll delegate the decision-making. That is our Savior. If we can simply hone in on the individual's desire to save, uh, to run his own life, there are three basic desires uh, that are instinctive in human beings. The desire to survive, to stay alive, 
the desire to have sex in order to, to procreate and to continue the species, and third, the desire to make one's own decisions and control one's own life. And no matter how hopeless it seems right now, you have to remember that in 1988, we all had good reason to believe that the Cold War would last forever and the Berlin Wall would forever be there as a symbol of conflict in the world. And yet, a year later, the Berlin Wall came down, and a year after that, the Soviet Union was no more. In 1980, no one would have believed that somebody could have run and been elected for president, pushing for smaller government. And not only was Ronald Reagan uh, campaigning on that basis, but the liberals were making him out to be even more libertarian than he really was, and he won by a landslide. Of course, he didn't carry through on that in any way whatsoever, but it demonstrates that the people can be on our side. And if we keep doing everything that we can, keep doing every form of outreach that we can, keep uh, pushing on this and making our views known wherever possible, someday, and I can't guarantee this, but somebody may come along who has the money, who has the influence, who has the connections, who has the power to get this message to the American people enough times that we can make a change in this country. And we should not give up and we should not let this opportunity pass us by. I am hopeful, even if not optimistic, meaning I can see how we can win this fight, even if I don't know that we will win it. So I beg of you, don't give up. But at the same time, don't give up your own life. Take care of yourself. This is Harry Brown. I look forward to talking with you next week. Thanks so much for spending this time with me tonight. Good night.